Hi and welcome to another lecture with Marine Biology at Home. Before we get started here, I want to remind you real quick to check out our Facebook page if you haven't yet. And remember that we also have a YouTube channel, so please make sure you like and subscribe to Biology at Home so you can find all of our content in one place and stay up to date as new lectures come out. So what are we learning about here? Well, this lecture is all about the human dimensions of conservation. How understanding the human dimensions can help us as we navigate complex ocean issues and conflicts and help us work towards conservation and sustainability goals. My name is Dr. Chelsea Crandall and I'm a fishery scientist. I'm here talking about people today because most of my work right now focuses in on something we call the human dimensions or the study of people and how they interact with and engage natural resources and systems like fish and our oceans. My background in general is pretty broadly interdisciplinary and I've worked in all sorts of different marine systems and with different organisms and I'm super excited to introduce you all to the human component of conservation and marine ecosystems today. Okay, so you may be saying to yourself, wait a minute, hold on, what? This is a marine biology class. Why are we talking about people? I'm here to learn about marine animals and marine ecosystems. Well, it turns out people are a really important part of conservation and of understanding what's going on in our marine ecosystems. In this lecture, I'll quickly, briefly introduce some of the questions that social science and human dimensions research, these fields that study people, can help us answer, and why this is important if our goals include sustainability or a future of marine conservation. Okay, so why are humans important? Well, to start with, people interact with the ocean and its inhabitants and care about the ocean in different ways and for different reasons. Documenting and understanding what people are doing and why is an important component of understanding our marine systems. Because people impact our marine systems. Whether we're talking about how we use natural resources, how we impact and alter marine and coastal habitats, how we change our climate, or how people pollute our oceans. It all comes back to the actions and attitudes of people. And therefore, understanding people is a really important part of conservation. And people can also have positive impacts on our marine systems. There are many behaviors people can enact that can help our marine ecosystems, for example, conservation behaviors or support for eco-friendly policies. And so again, human dimensions and social science studying people is an integral part of marine conservation. Understanding humans helps us manage our resources, helps us promote adoption of eco-friendly conservation behaviors, and helps us continue forward for a positive future for our ocean systems. And there are many things we study when we talk about people and how people are engaging with and impacting marine systems. One thing we look at that we'll talk a little bit about here is all the research that goes into figuring out not only what people are doing, what they're catching, what they're doing when they go to the beach and so on, but also the why behind our behaviors. What drives our behavior? Why do people do what we do? How can we use that to understand what might change behavior? Because again, there are many ocean-friendly behaviors people can adopt. Whether we're talking about turning off the lights on a beach to help sea turtles that are nesting, about riding a bike to reduce our carbon emissions, using paper and cloth products to reduce plastics, or more. Understanding what drives people's choices to adopt or maybe not adopt these behaviors is an integral part of conservation. So let's pause here for a second and think about behavior. What do you think drives behavior? What changes people's behavior? If you wanted to get people to, for example, turn off their lights at the beach, what would you do? Take about 10 seconds and think about this. Jot down some ideas if you have a piece of paper. I'll hang out here and wait and come back in 10 seconds. Oh, 
All right, I imagine you came up with some great ideas. Some of you may have thought about education. Often when we think about behavior and behavior change in the context of conservation, we go first to education and awareness. We think if we educate people, inform them, increase their awareness and knowledge, they'll act in more conservation-friendly ways. But it turns out this isn't often the case because people are complex and a lot of things drive our behavior. Think about this in other behaviors. Let's look at it in the context of personal health, for example. Think about the doctor who knows all about lung cancer but may still choose to smoke. Think about your own diet. I know I eat my fair share of fried foods even though I know it's not the healthiest choice for me. And so the first important thing to know about people is that we are not purely rational beings. We don't make choices based on knowledge alone. It's a lot more complex than that. And in fact, there are so many things that influence our choices and our behavior. And social science, again, that study of humans and people, has many theories that help us understand people's behavior. These are just a few examples here of the many things that can go into our decision making. And so if we want to change behavior, maybe encourage people to act in more eco-friendly or ocean-friendly ways, simply educating and informing people is not enough to accomplish that goal. Campaigns that take some of these other things into account, that pull from social science and our understanding of humans, might be much more effective. And again, it all comes back to understanding people. So another thing human dimensions and social science research helps us with is in understanding and navigating conflicts. Conflicts around our marine systems, our resources, how we use our resources, who gets to access them, and so on. And just as there are many things that shape our behavior, there are also many sources of conflict when we're talking about marine resources and ecosystems. These are a few examples of some of the sources of conflict here. One that we often overlook that we're going to focus on for a minute now is the role that values play in shaping our views and behaviors and contributing to conflict and misunderstandings and disagreements around resources like the ocean. So let's talk a bit, a, more, a bit more about values. Our personal values, which sometimes you might call worldviews, are in a sense the bedrock that underlies what makes us who we are. Values can play a big role in how we react to information and situations, but again, their role is often overlooked. And there are many ways we conceptualize people's values and worldviews. For example, one common framework is known as the new ecological paradigm, and that looks at where people's frame of reference falls along this continuum, ranging from egocentric, maybe I really just care about myself, I'm focused on myself, to anthropocentric, maybe I'm focused on all of humankind, to biocentric, maybe I view all living beings on the same level playing field, I care about all of them equally. To ecocentric, maybe I'm thinking about the whole planet equally. And often we focus in on where people fall along the anthropocentric, biocentric continuum. So for example, someone who is really anthropocentric in orientation might agree that humans have the right to modify the environment to suit their needs. Whereas someone who is more biocentric might agree that plants and animals have as much right as humans to exist. And where people fall along the spectrum can correlate with how they feel about wildlife, management, and natural resources. And that's just one way we conceptualize values. We could also talk about whether someone has a dominionistic or mutualistic worldview. Do you see humans as having dominion over the environment, over the ecosystems, over animals and wildlife? Or do you see it as more mutualistic? We're all in this together. We're, we're mutually interacting with our environment. We're on the same level playing field. That's just another example. And there's a lot of research measuring people's value orientations in the context of natural resources and wildlife. 
Take, for example, this recent study of Americans' wildlife values. This research found that Americans are divided with regard to their value orientations. Some have the frame that wildlife should be used and managed for the benefit of the people, while others view wildlife as part of their own extended social network. Some see it both ways depending on the context, and a few aren't really thinking about wildlife at all. So while value orientations, again, aren't often explicitly discussed when we're talking about resources, when we're talking about managing our oceans or conflict, you can imagine how they might underlie some of the different attitudes we see in our discussions about wildlife and habitat management and what's going on in our oceans and other ecosystems. And I'll pause here briefly just to introduce one more concept, and that is attitudes. Sometimes people talk about values and attitudes interchangeably, but they're, they're actually technically different things. So an attitude is someone's favorable or unfavorable, positive, negative evaluation of one specific thing, of a person, an action, an object, whereas the value, again, is that underlying orientation that can inform your attitude. So for example, I might have the value orientation that animals all have the same rights as humans, and therefore I might have a negative attitude about fishing. And so understanding people's values and the roles that values play in our conflicts around marine systems is an important step in helping us all work together to reach our shared goals. If we don't acknowledge diverse value orientations, we end up speaking past each other, we end up having one group saying, we need to protect and conserve the oceans to make it a great place for all the other wildlife because we're all in this together and we should all get along and so on. That very ecocentric orientation. And you might have another group speaking more from an anthropocentric viewpoint. No, but we really need to do this for the benefit of people. And because they're coming from two different value orientations, if you don't acknowledge that or recognize it, you don't really get anywhere. Again, you have groups just speaking past each other. And so it's important to think about how we can build shared understanding and come up with approaches in future that work across value orientations. Because values are unlikely to change. It's really hard to change someone's values and there's ethical questions about whether you even should. So understanding the different value orientations people have and how that affects how we interact with and feel about our resources and oceans and conservation is really important in navigating conservation and management questions moving forward. And this can help us as we continue to address some big questions that are out there in the context of marine animal conservation. For example, how do we manage competing needs? the needs of our marine organisms and ecosystems with diverse needs of people, diverse ways people are accessing and using the ocean and ocean environments. When we're, again, when we're talking about marine conservation, it's really important to not forget the human dimension, to think about the complex things that inform people's attitudes, people's behaviors that drive conflict, and how we can use all of that understanding to bring different perspectives together for a positive future for our oceans. We have to figure out ways to balance these multiple perspectives and multiple needs to accomplish our conservation goals. And human dimensions in social science is part of this bigger picture. It fits in with biology and ecology and other fields of research to help us understand these systems and conserve our oceans. Before we wrap up today, I want to encourage everyone to please help spread the word about marine biology at home. If you know people who might enjoy our content or might like to contribute, please send them over to our Facebook page. And remember, you can head there if you have any questions about today's lecture. And we have an awesome team contributing to this lecture series. And if you know someone else who wants to help or might be interested in helping, please get in touch. Thank you.